to the startup grind. So first question, which is what I normally ask, is where did you start in terms of, did you have entrepreneurial parents? Um, you know, where did the journey for you start in terms of uh, starting your own company? So we have one hour, right? So I have to be very <laughs> focused on the answer. Yes. So, <laughs> otherwise I can uh, drift very easily. So, whew, uh, no, I didn't have uh, entrepreneur uh, parents. My father was a, a dentist surgeon and my mom was a teacher. He's a teacher, was a teacher, they are both retired. So I was somehow born, this is something that, that uh, is a uh, thought for many years. At, at, somehow I was born in the best place in Lausanne, Switzerland, in the you know, uh, late 60s, early 70s. I was there, I mean, the most quiet, quiet, quiet place on the earth probably, you know, no computer to stress you and, you know, very quiet. So that was one of the best places on earth and, and probably, and then I discovered maybe that was not the best place for uh, IT startups maybe later on in my life. So even if still, it's still great, but then I discovered, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley at some point. So and this is really what changed, what changed me. So I was not exposed to entrepreneurial, um, uh, an entrepreneurial family, parents, no. So it really came late in, in my life somehow. But yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm opening too much doors, but uh, so. Yes, no problem. Um, so, for example, when you're 15, 16, I think that's when most people kind of start thinking about what they want to do with the rest of their lives. Yeah. What did you want to do with the rest of your life? I had no idea until 25. So, I mean, that's why now I'm, I'm not in a hurry to stress my daughter about, I mean, the, I mean, you have to do this, she's nine, you know, you have to do that and that, and people get stressed. We have friends that are very stressed about their children. I'm very relaxed. She has time, she has to discover herself and so on. So until 25, frankly, I didn't know. So, but somehow it's like Steve Jobs said, you are connecting the dots. So you're discovering actually there is a path or something in your life that is, uh, you know, a path. And I discovered somehow I was, I mean, that's one of the topics that I really like, is that I, I believe I'm really born at the, at the right time of human history, maybe, because I was born at the same time as the invention of a microprocessor, you know, okay. uh, that was invented in the early 70s. So I've seen somehow, and I'm, I'm the whole digitalization of, of the world somehow happening in, in front of me, you know, from this very quiet analog world to the, this massive digital world we live into now. That has great size and some frightening side at the same time too. So I've been able to go through that in different domains. Like, you know, for instance, in the 80s, there was the arrival on the market of the first digital synthesizer. So I, 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 I worked a lot on, on, on my spare time to, to, to buy one of the first, uh, you know, samplers for those who know what it is. It's a music <laughs> instrument. You can record your voice and everything. I was fascinated. I mean, I was really, I really believe I, I'm born at the, the best time of what I would like. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very lucky. And, um, and you know, all that has been somehow uh, an opportunity for me. And then at some point I met, uh, I met people that really activated in me the wish to do a company. I never thought about it. But in fact, without knowing it, I was always working with people on some project, like okay. doing, you know, music or doing, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, RC cars, you know, uh, remote control cars or things like that that you do when you're a child. I was always with people on projects. And so somehow it may make some sense later in my life to say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to work with people to build stuff and to try to aim at some goals. And yeah, but there was a trigger at some point. Maybe we can discuss about that. Okay. So, so funny trigger. Yeah. What was the trigger? Because I, I look I'm at your, your background um, from obviously it was yeah. very academic and then all no, of a sudden you had... No, no, I'm a school dropout. I must <laughs> confess in front of the camera, okay. I'm a school dropout. So, but I'm working at EPFL with PhDs and I'm yeah. surrounded by PhDs, very nice people, of course, very interesting, very emulating people. But, uh, but we would discuss that later probably. And uh, yeah. At some point, I was really bored by school, and it's a long discussion. Let's not open that door. Uh, 
And I really wanted to work with people. I did some studies in, in electronic engineering in the end. Mm -hmm. I didn't really like it, but I did my uh, diploma project on a beautiful thing called the next computer. I don't know who knows what is the next computer. <laughs> I mean, it's what Steve Jobs did when he was tagged as the loser, sorry, in front of the camera again. I mean, he really was for 12 years of his life not a success like he was, you know, a tag later uh, when he came back to Apple. So when he was uh, ousted from, from Apple, uh, he, he built this amazing company called Next Computer on which the web has been invented. And when I saw that, it was such uh, I mean, you have to realize that at the time, the computer, they were running DOS, for those who knows what it is. Uh, there was no network connection, can you believe that? There was token ring, probably you know that. You know token ring, no? no we have Ethernet now, sorry. But uh, they were not communicating those computers together easily, like everything does today. And the next came, the next came, and it was such a beautiful machine, uh, 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter cube, black in magnesium, such a beautiful machine. And everything was beautiful about it. The operating system was based, sorry, I'm going to be geek, was Mac based, M-A-C-H, uh, uh, kernel done at Carnegie Mellon. And on top of that, you have had object-oriented uh, libraries and tools that were very advanced. And everything was, written, uh, was drawn in PostScript. Sorry, I'm pitching it now. Uh, but basically, it was night and day uh, with anything else. When I saw that, it was such a shock. I can tell you, it was like coming from another planet. I, I never had such a shock. Maybe when Steve Jobs shown the first iPhone, that was another shock. But, uh, but since then, I never had such a shock. And then I put all my money, I, I asked my, gr my, my uh, grandma to, um, give me some, to, to, to give me some money to, because it was very expensive. It was something like 20,000 Swiss francs, you know, for a 25 megahertz processor in 1991, you know? But it was a, a piece of art, and that was, I mean, thanks to that decision to invest into that computer, I met amazing people. Some of them really triggered, to answer your question, yeah. triggered uh, this uh, wish to do startups. Those are two people that I must uh, thank. Um, two uh, brothers, uh, uh, called the Tsonis brother, let's say, they, are, they were based in Lausanne too, who were, completely crazy, they had a background, not a Swiss background, very quiet, very, you know, you don't have to, to uh, put yourself at risk, you yeah. can have a quiet life, and so on. They, they, they really came from a different background, so they, re they were really hungry, really, really hungry, and they were very ambitious and very smart, and uh, <laughs> they really showed me how fun it is to do a startup, and it, it was very early, it was in 91, and you know the startup scene, it was before the web, basically, as we know it, and before we knew it. And uh, yeah, but this was a very, very cool startup. They were actually, they sold their company to Kudelski, which is a, you know, a TV uh, security kind of company, for 50 million in 2001. They had 180 employees, and I've seen the whole thing uh, happening, and they really, I mean, it was an example for me. So, and then I did my own company based on that. But okay. before that, I didn't know what was a startup. And you know, we, we had no web. Can you believe that? I mean, by the way, the web was invented on that computer. And I was lucky enough to meet the inventor of the web, Tim Berners-Lee himself. Uh, at that time, he was a very uh, humble person who you can talk to him now. He's going to be part of the history book in 300 years, unlike me. And, uh, and uh, he was uh, there at EPFL, uh, I mean, give, being as an expert for uh, a student we were hiring that was doing his diploma project by, on building a new web browser, you know, in 93, that was so cool. We've seen the web uh, born in somewhere over there in Geneva, Lausanne, you know, and yeah, that, that was really a lot of, uh, I mean, um, yeah, it's a very nice to have been able to, to witness that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I got too enthusiastic. No, no, no that's, that's myself, good. So. Uh, you know, we get to, to understand well, how you think and, and why you are where you are. So obviously that's taking us to your first startup. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what happened with that and, and uh, a bit of history? 
So yeah, there was almost no web. I mean, uh, Mosaic and Netscape were not completely uh, available when we started. So basically, you have to imagine you have no access to information. You don't know what is a VC. You don't know what is uh, how it how it is to. It was just it's 20 years ago, huh? And uh, when the web came, there was those first sites popping up here and there, and you were we were discovering what was the startup model from Silicon Valley. I mean, it was so liberating. It was so liberating and uh, so exciting for people like me who somehow took uh, unconscious decision to. Uh, to go sideways and not follow the curses of you know, uh, very prestigious academia and so on. So for me, it was extremely liberating. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's like everybody, probably you do a couple of startup when you do a lot of mistakes and then you start to learn and then maybe at some point you stop to do mistakes. Yeah. And with Gillian, that's probably uh, the one where we made, or I made the less mistakes, probably. And I did some mistakes, but, uh, but, but initially the first startup was just a collection of mistakes. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the way it goes. So, so with that, yeah, I'm presuming that the startup didn't go well. And how did you take that? And, and, Actually, uh, the startup uh, lasted for 20 years. So, okay. so we, but the, the problem, the first thing I discovered was the mismatch of expectation between the nice people at the beginning want to found the company, and then, then there is a clash, and then uh, you, know, you have to, uh, to split uh, or to quit. So I discovered what was uh, this problem of not being in sync with your co-founders. So basically, we, yeah, we were four, and we discovered that yeah, we were not meant to work together, so we decided to, but it was very, uh, very uh, how to say that in English, nervous time. A uh, lot of, uh, lot of uh, bad energy uh, at that time. So many people have experimented that. It's, uh, we'll discuss that maybe later. But for me, this, um, this is the second level of the most important thing in when you create a company is having a strong uh, core of founders and a very nice relationship with the people that are really sharing the destiny of what you are building. That's the second level. The first one, maybe we talk later. But uh, and because it was so painful in my first startup, uh, but in the end, it, I mean, we split it, and it was nice for everybody. And also because I made a mistake in my second startup to be the sole founder. You know, I was doing all the mistake on, <laughs> without anyone to challenge me. Uh, uh, I mean, I had plenty of people around me, but nobody really sh being in the same boat in terms of being one of the main shareholder, uh, being exposed to all the problems all the time. You know, it was another big mistake not to repeat. So for Gillian, when I started Gillian, I mean, my first thing was to, to find a co-founder I was very comfortable with. And I was very lucky to, to meet someone at EPFL uh, without really looking for him or her. Um, it happened by accident because we were both geek on the same frequency, talking about things we really like together, having the same kind of view on things, how we must build it and so on. And we really enjoyed discussing together and invent the future world. So the future of the world or you got it. So yeah. Okay. So from that, I'm getting that obviously there was um, not failure in the stricter sense of the ter term, but uh, some failures that happened within your journey to get to, to Gillian. What advice would you give the entrepreneurs here? And I know obviously in Switzerland, failure is, is looked at in, a, in quite a negative way. So you have people who are very risk averse. What advice would you give to, to people who are, who are thinking about starting a company today? Yes, so failure is very painful. It's, uh, there's no, no question about it, it's true, of course. Um, I mean, I can tell you I was invited by the president of EPFL three months after we closed the company in 2001, my previous one, my previous, previous one. And uh, I mean, I cannot really in front of the camera tell you again everything that happened in that company, but basically somehow I felt betrayed by some people, you know. I found a solution for an exit and then, you know, so it, it, it didn't happen exactly like uh, we expected. 
So I was not really ready to assume publicly, like the president of EPFL asked me to present in a very economical forum somewhere, why we failed, you know. I was not ready for that. So it's true that failure is painful. Uh, but the important thing is that you have to digest it. You have to learn from it. If you learn from it, I mean, it's going to, I mean, it's, it's Nietzsche that said that, right? What doesn't kill you uh, makes you stronger. Yeah. And this is very true. I mean, I experimented that. I refused to, uh, to, to go into depression, you know, or things like that. I mean, uh, I mean, it's part of life. I mean, you fail, you made a mistake, you have to assume them. Because in that case, in this second startup called Singularis, by the way, we were so lucky and it was like a gold, uh, golden trap, we say that? Yeah. Uh, because we had too much money, you know? Uh, it was in the dot-com era. We raised 10 million Swiss francs very easily, no product, nothing. Uh, just a business plan wrote, uh, wrote in, in two weeks. And uh, I mean, that was crazy. And all those guys, they asked me to spend all my money in six months, you know? And, in, and I was too young because in, in, in my guts, they were telling me it's not right. You don't have to hire 30 people in six months. And we, we felt lame, you know, just 30 people in six months. We were reading articles in, in Red Herring magazine, things like that, where they, read, they were hiring 600 people in six months, the, the winners, you know. Yeah. And on our side, we were, I just hired 30 people, you know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really know them. I mean, and Reto was one of them, so <laughs> hi, Reto. <laughs> I mean, I knew you because you were one of the most popular employees at the time. You are the youngest, right? You are the youngest employee, right? Yeah. yeah. You are our mascot, basically. So, <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah, it was, my guts told me uh, something, or many things were wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, the team, the technology was great. We were so advanced. The vision, everything was great. We were building a bank of profiles to help users manage their profiles back in 98 to go through services and devices to, you know, get recommendations, but, but safeguarding your privacy, you know, back in 98. Can you imagine that? In 2014, it's quite interesting topic. Uh, sorry, I'm, I sound arrogant, but yeah, it was cool. <laughs> and, uh, but then, you know, the environment, everything was so new. There was no real VC in Europe. I was wasting my time talking with people that didn't understand anything about startup. They just had money to invest in a foolish way. And uh, that was a crazy time. So, yeah, it, it really teached me a lot of things. So with Gillian, we did completely different. Okay. Um, that yeah, poses two questions. First oh, yeah, of all, and that's, uh, no problem. We, we want to hear you, not me. So <laughs> <laughs> please feel free. Um, that poses two questions. The first question is, how do you compare raising money during that time with the dot-com era to, to now when we're in the web 2.0? Yeah. And also, how, what do you think of the Swiss venture uh, angel funding scene in terms of uh, do you think there's enough money for the, the, the companies that are out there or do you think there's more that can be done? I will stay very humble with that because I just can talk probably about what we experienced with uh, Gillian. Mm -hmm. And we were so focused, you know, uh, with your company, you don't have, I mean, enough time to, uh, to discuss with other entrepreneurs, which is not good. Or you don't have also the broad vision of the coaches in Switzerland or all the people that are working horizontally in the ecosystem. But what I can tell you is that I believe, I mean, there is no... It's night and day between uh, then, in, nine, in 2000, let's say, and now in 2014. I mean, but you already know that, of course. I mean, uh, first of all, the, the new economy or the, the digital uh, economy is here. It's solid. Uh, all the major uh, players, they have a lot of uh, means and cash and ways to invest in a way or another in new promising stuff. So, but at the time, I mean, it was really... A, completely foolish. I mean, uh, I've heard from someone on, 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 on a show the other day that, uh, I mean, companies basically, they were doing an IPO to, to raise money to, to execute their business plan and build their product. They, they had no real customers and so on. That was, they, there was hundreds of IPOs apparently at the time in this, uh, in this fashion, you know? Yeah. That was, and then it, 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 uh, everything uh, exploded in the air. So, 
that was not sane. And I think it, I mean, I don't think bubbles are normal. I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, I probably it's, uh, it maybe it's, it's might be a, a thing that is standard for, 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 for capitalism. Uh, you need maybe bubble, maybe, I don't know. I'm not a, a, theor a theory guy on, on capitalism. Um, but I don't think necessarily, I mean, it might have happened differently. So I'm not sure this huge purge that happened in 2001 was really necessary because a lot of good things also disappeared. Uh, good things that were supposed to be funded while stupid things were funded. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, you know, okay, so I learned about that. And now the good thing, the good news is that today, I think is the best time to do an IT startup. I mean, I'm not going to comment on other type of startups in, I don't know, life science or, you know, uh, other stuff. I don't know the, the, how it works, basically. It's completely different. But for web startups, it, either it's, if it's a service or, a, or technology, it's so much uh, easier and better. It's still difficult, and you have a lot of things that you have to do on the personal level that are, remain the same. For me, that's the key, working on yourself. Maybe we'll discuss about that. That's the first layer. And, uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know, Reto, I'm going to ask you <laughs> if you remember, but I told that to some other guys uh, er earlier, but can you imagine that? We needed, sorry, we needed 15 engineers to do things that we can do now with two or maybe three, you know? It's so much productive today, so you need less capital. You have Amazon that has built the cloud revolution and other people, Microsoft and so on. But, uh, but uh, at the time, you, you, we had to send you or some other people in Washington, in a data center, to open a cage, put some server there manually. Can you believe that? Yes, it happened. And with a switch that you control from Switzerland on off to reboot the, 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 the freaking computer there, that was our server. And the database, and you know, we spent so much money on Oracle, sorry, and many things. So, okay. Fortunately, today, it's crazy. I mean, you don't need all that. I mean, it's the best time to do to, to, You can really focus on yourself because of your ego. No, because of you have to work on yourself to be better. And, and you can focus on the team. You can focus on the big vision. And you can really have fun and less stress. It's still stressful, but it's less stress. And then we will talk probably about exit too. There are many, many companies that are uh, interested in, uh, in acquiring... Uh, good small teams doing great stuff and uh, I mean it's a very good time to do a startup now as well. I mean I don't feel old at all. I feel, I mean I'm 46, I must confess, and uh, I don't feel old at all. I mean it's the best time uh, to do a startup. But still if you're 20 it's better because you have plenty of energy to waste. It's not my case. So uh, anyway. Okay. Going on to a question with regards, um, obviously something that you, you picked up after your two previous startups, mm -hmm. which is uh, company culture and having the right team. Yeah. Um, how important is that? And, and with uh, Gillian, how did you get that mm -hmm. mix correct versus the other two? Yeah. That was the, the topic that most stressed me because that's the most challenging one. And um, so everybody knows that teams are very important. We all know that, right? But how does it work in the details? And this is something I had to look at it uh, backward when we sold the company in January to Dailymotion. Uh, I really had to digest, digest what happened uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this company, in this uh, uh, last adventure. Um, and uh, I realized how we worked actually with my co-founder. First of all, I was, I really wanted to prove myself I was not going to be a serial loser, you know? So I had to reset the counter, and this is what I've done. And basically, for me, this exit has been the most important thing. Uh, not, I mean, okay, there are many interesting things to discuss of the benefit of the exit, of course. Uh, okay, you sell the company, you sell your shares, that's great, and so on. You make people happy, your investor, and so on. That's very important. But also for yourself, you prove a lot of things to you. And uh, I was very happy to, to, to be able to, 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 to prove that to me. Um, but uh, to come back on the team uh, and the challenge it poses, I realized that uh, I somehow unconsciously uh, developed some sort of uh, methods, if you want. Uh, and 
I really wanted to like building a house properly, you know? You start with the foundation, you start with, re you, or even before that, you start to, to think about why do you want a house? Is it to impress your friend? Or is it that you really need the space? Or you want to, leave, to go away from the city? Or, you know, many things like that. So we, we ask exactly the same kind of question to ourselves with my co-founder, Zeno, who was the, I mean, an amazing co-founder to work with. We discussed about that. And we really ask ourselves, uh, why do we want to start a company? What kind of goals we really want to, to, to have together? What, what will make our uh, journey uh, uh, exciting and, and full of joy despite the difficulties and the stress and the exposure to, to, to failure potentially? So we really work on the psychological aspect of things. I have no diploma in that matter, you know, in that domain. But, I mean, you have to work on the psychological aspect of things. And um, probably because I was older, I was m more capable to, th to ask me these kind of questions. Because when I was 20, I didn't think about it, you know. I was just obsessed about uh, efficiency, being quick. I was so impatient, you know. And... Uh, so with my co-founder, we really spent some time to be sure our core was uh, going to be strong and we could survive the difficult times. And it proved to be the case. And we worked actually for seven years, you know, because the, the, the Sublime Video product that was sold to Dailymotion was for four years. But before that, we, we worked on another project together for three years. So it was a seven-year cycle, you know. So, so to come back on the team, sorry for the long answer, uh, if you do this first layer self-assessment, this is what I believe, this is my method. Uh, uh, if you do this self-assessment of your true motivation, why do you, do you want to do it? Why do you want to have a crazy life for many years? Why do you want your family to support you all the time? How can you, how can you sustain that? Uh, how can you prove to yourself it's going to worth it? Uh, or to check that it's going to worth it? Okay, you do this first thing of self-assessment of, of what you want to do, why you want to do it. Then you find, that's the second layer, as I said, uh, 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 someone who can share uh, this, uh, this burden and this joy, the, a, a true co-founder. And, and at this stage, it was very important to, uh, to uh, establish some rules. So we really discuss about the rules together. I really realized also because of my experience, he was much younger, so he was bringing, you know, the online kind of capacity of knowing everything that was happening, you know, that was not my case anymore. He was a young engineer working with you, by the way, and uh, at EPFL. And uh, so that, this guy was online 24 hours seven, you know. I was not any more capable of that, so I, somehow I needed him for that. And he needed me for experience. So we really brought value to the company, value that will, was recognized. If there is at some point a co-founder that suffers a bit, is uh, undervalued, or is not allowed to show his value, that creates danger for the company. So we really work on, on establishing those uh, two-cylinder kind of engine was working well. Um, and I think, by the way, two is a sweet spot. Uh, I mean, if you are four or five, if you have good interpersonal uh, skills, that's great. It's going to work, probably. And my friends uh, that sold the company to Kudelski, they were four people, amazing people. You, you, you might have made a movie with them, you know? There was, sorry, you will recognize yourself. There was the Yakuza guy, the sales guy. There was, uh, there was the lawyer guy, uh, reckless guy, sorry. It's in front of the camera, but nobody will watch it on YouTube, probably. <laughs> but, uh, and there was the visionary guy that everybody loves. He was always smiling. Sorry, you're going to recognize yourself, too. And there was the, the how do you call that in English? The guy who was always thinking about everything's bad that is going to happen to the company. <laughs> and uh, they were so complimentary, you know? You couldn't have made a movie with those guys. That was really a movie. I mean, the things we did with them, that was crazy. I mean, uh, so many anecdotes. And uh, so the team, OK, that's the third layer. I mean, when you have worked on this first layer, the second layer, which is the co-founder core, then you, are, you have to work not on the team. You know what? You have to work on the third layer, which is for me to establish, like in a family, when you get married, uh, somehow you have developed a culture, and then you are ready to accept children, you know? So I was seeing, sorry for the employees of Gillian, I was seeing you as my children. No, OK. You can use also the uh, gardener uh, metaphor, if you prefer. But uh, yeah, you have to establish, uh, 
I mean, it's not a buzzword or a marketing uh, a term. It's really something that you, that you feel. You are, you, with your co-founder, you establish the rules, the, not the rules, the, the culture, maybe the ethos uh, of how you want to, to work together. And, and you are going to hire people that are compatible with that. And that was really, really happy times because we were, we were very small when we were acquired. We were six, but I had so, so much pleasure uh, most of the time to work with uh, our employees. I mean, we really were forming a nice team. And for me, that was something I was uh, anxious to succeed at, you know, working with people I was compatible with. and. And I'm still very anxious that it was not completely a success and that I have so many things to learn in, on that domain, you know. And, but having established those three layers worked for us very beautifully because we really created, like, uh, I don't know, uh, the condition for something beautiful to happen, you know. And this is what happened to us because we started on a project, on a music kind of uh, domain to build a social network for musicians. That's a long discussion. And then three years later, working secretly on that, I mean, this accident of building the first HTML5 video player happened. We did the first HTML5 video player on the market. You know, for those who don't, are not familiar with web technologies, it's without using Flash as a, an engine to, to play video in a web browser, you know. Okay, it's a bit geeky, but, uh, you know. Basically, we did the first one with custom control, and we got a huge buzz, but we were going to discuss that. But it happened not... Uh, by chance. I mean, it happened by accident, but not by chance, if I may say that, because we created the conditions for beautiful things to happen. And this is really a process that I enjoyed a lot. And people might have think we were arrogant because we really believed in what we were doing. We really were just looking at the best possible thing you can build with, with no compromise. We hated the average stuff. We didn't like to, to waste our time building average stuff. We really aim at trying to shine with beautiful uh, web technologies, and we've been recognized thanks to that kind of uh, uh, spirit, you know? And that, this is how it works. And, and uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about that. Sorry, I do the answer to the question, right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> So kind of moving on, as you've built this business, you've got the culture going. Um, uh, I don't know whether we, we, we can talk of, of, about this on camera, but uh, uh, after you launched the HTML5, you were approached by uh, a, a big company that I think everybody in this room knows. Can I mention the name? Uh, yes, because I checked we are not on, on, on NDA anymore. Uh, okay. So it's possible, but okay, if you want. So approached by Google, mm -hmm. um, who obviously wanted to, to buy you, mm -hmm. um, and why did you turn that down? I think for yeah. most of us, that would be, uh, as an entrepreneur, to yeah. be approached by a company yeah. that's that successful mm -hmm. um, would be an opportunity we'd jump at. Of course. So it was something that uh, for us has been very interesting, uh, and I hope for you maybe also, um, if I tell you a, a bit more about that. So. Uh, what happened is that, okay, this accident happened of, we, you know, we had this little demo of, just was just a demo of the first video player with custom control using HTML5, the web standard, not using Flash, you know. There was this, at the time where, you know, there was this big fight between Adobe, which is uh, or the owner of Flash, and the web community that was pushing HTML5 as an open standard. And with, uh, you know, Steve Jobs, I said he didn't want to have Flash on iOS. There was the iPad uh, coming out on the market. It was 2010. So we were really at the right time. And my co-founder, actually, and our designer, Octave, they, because they were so uh, passionate about web technologies, they knew HTML5 APIs were, go were published and the first team implementation was going online in something like Christmas uh, 2009, 2010. So they built this first demo, and uh, we put it online. And then I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> Sorry. They put it online, because I think it's important to know that. Um, they put it online, and then we got a huge buzz on Twitter. Uh, we got something like uh, 3,500 followers on Twitter in one week, up from zero, because we were secretly working on the, on, on the other project at EPFL. 
And then that was a huge shock, and because it was like an internal putsch, I was not ready for, for that, you know, myself. I was very focused on our musical project. And, uh, but then after, uh, we realized there was so much good vibes coming out of Twitter, asking us to do an actual product with this player. There was really something happening. I, I mean, HTML5 was so important. It's still important today, but at that time, it was the start of the hype of HTML5 in the media. And so, yeah, we decided there was an opportunity there to build a strong, quality solution, uh, very uh, state-of-the-art solution for the market in order to allow people to have basically their video playing on any device, on any browser, seamlessly, and to basically move to the next stage of what will be the video platform in a browser after Flash, you know? Uh, and uh, so we decided to do that. So because what happened is that we were based, okay, we were based in Lausanne, Switzerland, with almost no other web companies around us. We felt quite alone sometimes. And we had this kind of, uh, we, 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 we were really lucky, and it happens actually the second time in my life, to get this US-based uh, somehow blessing of what we were doing. I mean, most of the, the hype we got, most of the buzz we got came from web developers, mostly located uh, in the US, some in Europe, but mainly in the US. And we had the chance to be uh, recognized by very influential people. One of the, them was, uh, the most important one probably was a guy, you might not know him, he's a very important blogger in the, the Mac scene, Apple scene. Uh, he's called John Gruber, he's a solo blogger uh, with a huge number of uh, readers and followers and he really liked what we did. So he is a geek himself, and he asked us, are you sure your servers are ready for me to talk about what you do? We said, yes, I mean, we had a server in France with some cache, we activated the cache on the server, you know? No problem. And then you go on stage, and then boom, no electricity anymore, 400 requests per second, you know, on our web page. After six months, there were one million unique visitors on that page. I mean, that was crazy. And uh, I can tell you, I, okay, I'm going to tell you some stories. One of our, our designer, at some point, you know, he was, uh, sorry, Octave, I'm going to talk about you now. I mean, he was uh, somehow a young and poor musician in France, you know, working in supermarket to earn some money, but a very talented web designer at the same time, and we hired him, he, he came to Switzerland, worked like crazy with us, with, like the rest of the team, and uh, at some point, he told me when we got this huge buzz that I never experienced before, because remember, in 2001, there was no Twitter, no social networks. Uh, he told me, maybe this is too much. I'm going offline. Because basically, he was receiving tweets. I mean, I mean we, were, we were doing common, common R on the keyboard every, like, uh, you know, uh, every two seconds. You know? Every two seconds, there were 10 new tweets of people retweeting the news. You know? That was crazy. That was very. That was way too much for for everybody and him in particular because he was receiving tweets from people he admired, uh, like the, the the designer of the Firefox icon was telling him. I don't know if it was him or another guy to, told you, "Oh, Octave, your design makes mine look like word clip art." You know, so <laughs> it was too much good vibes for him. You know. Ooh, and then, and then what happened is that U.S. companies started to knock at the door three months after this initial buzz. The first one, we didn't sign an NDA with them, so I can tell you they were, uh, it's Brightcove actually, they just contacted us. It's a very nice company, I mean, I don't know, professional, uh, dom they are the first company probably, uh, I guess, I don't, I don't remember if it's exactly the case today, but at the time they were the, the most important uh, provider of professional video platforms, end-to-end -end video platforms if you want. It's a kind of professional YouTube if you want to monetize your content and so on. And basically they were interested in the talent acquisition, you know? This is uh, when you're just six people hype in, on the HTML5 scene, okay, they are looking for engineers, they want to acquire you. And it was just three months, at, we're just at the beginning of this story, so, okay, you, sorry, again, I'm going to disclose things, I mean, we, I mean, <laughs> we, received a, uh, we received a contact from a guy who was a corporate director, you know, and my co-founder, he didn't know what, sorry, you know, he didn't know what was a corporate uh, the development guy. 
you know, I told him, Zeno, this guy is going to propose to discuss with us about acquisition. He said, wow, really? And, you, and I said, yes, you will see. And then we had a Skype, a very nice uh, person we discussed, and he, he asked us if we were, would be interested to discuss that possibility, and we said, uh, we said, we said, okay, I, I was thinking, okay, maybe that would be interesting to learn about this process, you know? But he really wanted to, us to give him an honest answer whether or not we would be interested. So we, we went to the team, they, were, they didn't quit their eye on, on the screen, they said, no way. So, <laughs> so, okay, I had my answer, so I came back to the guy uh, with another Skype and said, okay, sorry guys, it's too early, we want to to leave this a bit further maybe, but let's keep in touch, of course. Uh, we'll see, maybe one day. And then what happened is uh, with, uh, with YouTube in Zurich, actually, a kind of similar process happened where uh, a year later, uh, we we're still in, in this buzz phase, and, but then we already had started to launch a real product six months before. We had real users. It was a very innovative product. It was a cloud-based, everything is cloud-based, video player. So it was uh, managed centrally by ourselves. So we, because HTML5 is a mess, you know, it, it can, in, in a matter of days, it can, be, uh, it can be broken on that browser, on that version of that browser, on that device, on, you know, it's a mess to manage. So we had to do it in a central way. And by the way, we had stats, we have many advantages of having this kind of cloud uh, infrastructure. And for HTML5, uh, it, was, it, it made sense, which was not really the case for Flash, which is, was much more stable in somehow, because only working on PCs and Macs and so on. Anyway, so, um, so what happened is that, yeah, again, somehow we were in Lausanne, and we were at the stage where we were financed by angel money. And actually, we made an exit without having any VC money. We just had one million Swiss franc of angel money plus money coming from government, grants, and things like that, that everybody knows in that room. Um, but we have very little money, I can say, I can tell you, compared to what we would have raised probably in the US with such uh, an exposure and, uh, and uh, domain. So what happened is that, yeah, we, were, we, we didn't know the, the Google guy, and what happened is that we met uh, people from Index Ventures, we really were interested to have their feedback. They really gave us a very, very interesting feedback on, 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 on what we were doing. We were really at the beginning, so we established contact with them because I really want, if we had to raise money with VC, I really wanted to have the best VC possible and not waste my time with uh, less interesting VCs. And I can tell you it makes sense because what happened is that uh, the person at, uh, at Index, one of the partners, he knew, we didn't, that YouTube was organizing an event with the top European video companies in Europe, you know? And, and they were inviting them in Zurich, so we came to Zurich. And, uh, but we, because we were late, we were not in those circle of information, uh, the, the, the schedule was already set, so where there was no room for us to present. But then what happened is that a company uh, abroad was blocked at the airport, so they told us, okay, if you want, you can present in 30 minutes. We had no presentation. I mean, we had a few slides here and there, and my, my oh, sorry, you know, sorry again. My, my, my co-founder, he really very meticulous. He prepared everything he's doing, you know. When he's very, you know, he think about all the details. And this is the time where I start, I decided for the first time in my life that I will never again prepare uh, a presentation that I will always improvise with a couple of bullets in my head. So, not bullets, sorry, uh, bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, it's my English, sorry. So, so, we were so enthusiastic and boosted, but while we were leaving, it was market-driven. People were shouting at us to release the product earlier and faster. It was market-driven. There was no business plan, you know? And, uh, so we are so excited that I took the opportunity. I really understood that we had to show that joy, that we have to show that enthusiasm. It was genuine, and that was our differentiation somehow. Before that, we had company with people with ties. Nobody's in ties, okay. So, so I'm not going to offend anyone. So I'd like to wear a tie, but I'm working on a university campus. I never am allowed to wear a tie. So, so, but yeah, they were very serious people with bullet points and so on, and somehow, yeah, it was not so exciting. 
And we arrived with this fresh energy, and I think they liked it. And what happened is that two months after that, they, they asked us to come in Zurich, discuss for some potential partnerships, you know, like dating. And uh, <laughs> I learned that. I didn't really know, but my instincts told me, oh, it's a bit strange. And OK, I'm going to tell a lot of things now. It's not under NDA, NDA anymore. Basically, we met very, very nice people because, uh, yeah, they are nice people, of course. Uh, and it was so attractive. It's a dream. I mean, you're going to be maybe bought by Google, you know? Uh, everybody wants that. So, uh, supposedly. And uh, so we really talk about that. But the thing is, and you, it's known, it's publicly known. When they do acquisition, most of the time they need the team to work on something else and they shut down what you do. And we felt bad about our little baby. I mean, that was just starting to, to have huge traffic with already millions of views, you know, uh, after six months of free beta. And, oh, that was so hard, you know, after six months to kill the baby, we have something like 5,000 websites using us with crazy people. Like, you know, you know Little Big Planet on, on PlayStation 3? They will, they will hear to that, but uh, PlayStation, PlayStation 3, Little Big Planet, you know the game? It's a very nice game for children. So those guys, they launch their games with our beta player, you know? It's a multi-million investment from the Sony uh, subsidiary uh, studio. Uh, they invested a huge amount of money and they launched their game on their homepage with our player. We saw a huge spike in, st in the stat. We say, oh, what is, what is that? We look at it and it was, uh, it was those guys. And so we were so excited and we were having meeting with those person at Google and YouTube in Zurich, where they develop a part or a good part of the player, apparently. And they were telling us, okay, this is very interesting. This was a uh, game, okay. but this is so tiny compared to what we do. And we need you to, we need HTML5 experts and we'd love to work with you. And basically it was a talent acquisition again. And I, I don't know. I will always remember this call I made to the, the, the what's the name of the um, of his position, the m a director of Europe, uh, based in London. And I, I called him. I said, "Okay, we really love. Uh, we really are. In, I mean, good contacts with you. We we love what you propose us, but it's too difficult for us. I mean, we really have to see how it works further. We were something like two months away from commercialization." And the stat, the, the survey were showing amazing conversion rates, you know, a lot of money coming in, you know, and we were like uh, the, the king of the hill uh, with a lot of cash coming in the company, completely independent, you know, no VCs, nobody going to tell you what you have to do and so on. And uh, actually it never materialized like that. So uh, <laughs> it's amazing. We sent... We had 8,000 websites when we did this survey. We had 2,000 people replying. Can you imagine that? 25% replying to the survey. That was such a beautiful uh, a community of people who really wanted to, to help us to, to improve our, our new product. And based on those stats, and we work with a university uh, in Geneva in economic to, to shape this survey to try to find the right price, you know, for cloud-based services, subscription-based services that we were. We have to find what is the right price. We made this big mistake to, to launch the service commercially only on a paid basis. There was no freemium. It was not free, it was only paid. Uh, so after six months, we realized it, this, this was foolish, so we moved to freemium, which multiplied by 13 our acquisition rates. 13 when we moved to freemium. And, um, but yeah, we really wanted to see if we would be able to stay, um, to develop our business on our side, and what happened is actually the conversion was 6% initially, which is not bad, but then the, 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 the growth of the revenue was not like we expected like that, it was more like that. Apparently all startups or many startups go through this kind of uh, valley of death of revenue growth, you know. And uh, nine months after we said no to YouTube, I can admit in front of the camera, frankly we regretted it a, a bit. We regret it a bit. I must be honest. I must be honest. We said we are completely crazy. I mean, we just had the problem. We were in the red financially. None of us were uh, wealthy. I mean, we were coming from uh, middle class families, but we were not wealthy, you know? And they were proposing a good amount of money um, that would have changed our life. So somehow we said we took that decision and we, uh, we will. 
this, we respect that decision that we made, but at the same time, we said, maybe we made a mistake, maybe, I don't know. So we said, okay, it's like that, you have to assume it, let's move to the next steps, but what it teached us is that, okay, we said with Zeno, my co-founder, we said, okay, next time it will happen, because we knew it will probably happen again, we have to be much more prepared for such a scenario to happen. This, this is where we started to think about m and in advance, not waiting for it and then people knock at the door and so on. So maybe we'll talk about that too later, but uh, yeah, we said no basically to answer your question finally to Google because we really wanted to really see if our product had as much potential as we hoped. And actually it had, but actually probably we should have put it completely for free immediately but then you would have to be in the US raising money there or with big VC in Europe that support your vision and it's less than in the US. And devising, as you, most of you know, uh, revenue opportunities later. And, but there are many ways to monetize what we were doing. But we should have, we should have. I mean, we find a compromise that we were obliged to, 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 to take because we were based in Switzerland, we were uh, having to pay the salaries, I knew that one, one thing was to be also able to last the time necessary to be, to be successful. Sometimes you have to go through some sort of, uh, you know, arid valleys. Yeah. And uh, so we, did, we were really, really working on diminishing the risks. And yeah, we did miracles with, uh, how do you say in English? I mean, uh, change money. I mean, yeah. Okay. Okay. We have a question from uh, one of the audience. Can you tell us what the valuation was they proposed, and also like kind of the, 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 the deal, like how many, yeah. how much time do you need to, to yeah. remain and stuff? What? Okay, it's in several millions, but uh, it was just for the team, you know. They, they, they didn't really made a formal offer, but they told us what the range would be if we would pass the test the Google test, you know, a crazy test. I told them, are you sure you're going to ask me to do a math test? Are you sure? Okay, I'm pretty good in Excel, but that's, that's all, you know, <laughs> you know? So, come on, okay. okay, okay, anyway. That's my punk side, sorry. And um, so basically that was a lot of money. I mean, basically with Zeno, we had 80% of the capital of the company. So we were going to have several millions of uh, dollars in our bank account. And what I can tell you is that, and that's the good thing, and frankly, we were proud about it without uh, uh, wanting to, be, uh, to sound arrogant uh, with that, but selling to Dailymotion was very satisfying for us because they paid roughly the same money, but they took the technology and the team not only the team, but the technology as well. They really wanted to use the technology. So, and I'm not saying that working for Google would not have been fun. Of course it would have been, I'm sure. But, you know, this was so satisfying for us to, okay, we got the same money. We could have probably got more, a better price if we would have sold to a US company, maybe three times more. Uh, and by the way, Dailymotion was supposed to sell to Yahoo. So we were supposed maybe to, to pitch Yahoo at some point. But then the French government decided that they were not going to let this French jewel company sold to a US player. So they, they killed the deal at the last minute. The deal was ready to be signed on the table. Dailymotion was to be acquired by Yahoo. We were about to build the Yahoo players potentially. That was amazing, you know, a double acquisition. All that from Lausanne, Switzerland, you know, with the, the, the biggest uh, advertiser on, on, online, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, so, so yeah, that was a satisfaction. Basically, we got the same price. I cannot really tell you the price because it's a confidential uh, clause that we have in the contract with Dailymotion. So, but yeah, I mean, in the end, it was not a question of money for us, really. Uh, we were selling at an okay price, not a, a, an amazing price, but an okay price for everybody, including our investors. Uh, but most importantly, the technology was part of the package, so that was great. And in the end, we were proud of, about saying no to the nice walls of Google because it, 
I mean, people, if, people, if someone was thinking that we were just uh, speculating, you know, try to sell the company as quickly as possible, which is something you have to think about, but it's delicate kind of thinking to manage at the same time that you have to stay excited about your product, you know? So it's very uh, complex thing to manage, but you can, you can manage that, it's possible. But, but we were not obsessed by selling the company initially. Actually, it was not for sale initially. But then when we said no to Google, we said, okay, it's going to be a possibility because first, we are not going to be able to raise money that easily in, in Europe, we believe. Maybe we were wrong, but we didn't even spend time. We, we talked to two VC. We talked just once with Greylock that was introduced to us by one of our angels. Very nice people. I really felt they were more advanced than, than, than we were in our projections, you know, in our vision somehow, which is, uh, wow, great. But with most of the people we were talking locally, I must say, yeah, we felt a bit bored, you know, because they, they didn't know anything about the web and what was happening, and, you know, they were really nice people, but not in this industry. We met people from a Swiss bank, very well-known Swiss bank. They have 100 million to invest, and one of the guys from this group told us, don't waste your time with us. We just, invest, we just invested in a company that is uh, selling sandwiches, so my board is probably not going to understand a cloud-based service. You know, they're not going to believe in what you do, because uh, and this is one of the most, uh, one of the best uh, analysts are coming from that bank. So, so yeah. So that's why also we sold in the end because we were also facing this kind of skepticism that we have that I hate. Sorry to say that in in around us in in Europe, people they they believe you're going to fail. They're you know, it's not like, there was an article in tech.eu from a young lady, a French lady, who has experimented both sides, Europe and the US. I cannot, I cannot uh, say anything because I, I really even spend my time in that, actually, because industrial partners came to us much faster than uh, VCs. Uh, but uh, what she's telling is that she experimented this kind of skepticism in Europe in general that, that makes much harder and longer to raise less money, actually, than in the US. So at the same time, we have to be careful because maybe it's a mirage also what we believe is happening in the US. I also know cases of startups that have failed in Silicon Valley uh, very uh, brutally uh, because there was no money anymore, because they didn't reach uh, huge targets, and then boom, the company was killed. And it can be very also, I mean, it's not the ideal place probably, but. Uh, yeah, so that's why we said, okay, considering everything, considering the fact I didn't want to have a second failure in my life, we said, okay, let's not be all in. Let's, let's, let's work on this second option. If we cannot raise the money as easily as, as we, we needed at some point, uh, and as fast as we needed, then let's have this track ready because there are these ongoing flux of people coming to us saying, this is great what you do, we love what you do, our engineers, our engineers knows you, uh, know, know you, you know? So we, we, we work on that in advance. Actually, two years before the, the deal was uh, signed, we actually prepared that. Now, yep, please go ahead. Ah. Uh, is it confidential? I have to think about the contract. But uh, <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, Dailymotion, we, I don't know if because they were speaking French and we were speaking French, I mean, we really got along very easily because we were speaking French together. Maybe that's an explanation. And you know, on the French side of Switzerland, we, I think we know France better than they know Switzerland. Uh, they, I think. Uh, so there was this kind of compatibility we knew in which ecosystem they were evolving, their challenges they told us and so on. We met very nice people on, on, from the CEO, everybody. We had very good contact uh, with, at the, on the personal level with, with all of them. And that was amazing. What they, I mean, in most of the acquisition deal, they want to lock you for maybe two, maybe three years. In that case, they told us, we don't want to do that. We want you to work with us. Uh, we want only to work with people who are motivated uh, to stay. So that was quite surprising. I told them, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> it was not my role to ask that, but I double checked. And yes, they said that. So what was your question related to that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so 
But yes, that was quite surprising, frankly, because most of the time when you do talent acquisition, you want to lock the team. But then you're locking people that are maybe not completely, genuinely motivated. So what will be the end result? So in our case, and actually this is what's happening as we speak, the plan was to, OK, I cannot talk about that. Uh, but basically, there was some integration to be made with Dailymotion of our technology, our know-how, if you want, into their platform. That was so great. We had a guy in, in, at Gillian who was with us maybe for just two, three years. As a, he interrupted his studies. He did his bachelor at PFL, but not his uh, master, because he wanted to work in a startup. He worked like crazy, hugely passionate. And then those guys at Dailymotion proposed us basically to embark into a new order of magnitude to move from 30 million video views per month, which was quite nice, to what they have today, probably which is three or four um, billions per month, you know? And uh, this is what my co-founder is working on now as we speak, to, to build this next generation player with them. And hopefully early next year, this milestone will be met and for us, it was something very important because selling the company, you know, most of the time, uh, very often, maybe not most of the time, but everybody knows that it might be a failure, you know? And, okay, and there are, there are companies that acquire companies just to kill them. We knew so, some people that advised us at the time, former VC, retired VC, one, one person who was very close to us to advise us on how it works in the, the details to how you have to manage the m &A firm, you know, the people who work with you. They told us, you know, that company, they acquire many companies just to kill potential competition early on. Like, uh, you know, uh, in uh, biblic biblical uh, <laughs> famous stories that you might uh, remember. So, so yeah, so it's, it's quite shocking. And, um, but that was definitely not the goal of uh, Dailymotion. They really needed, they had their shopping list. They had three very important key strategic items. One was to have a better player, basically. So we were very happy to say yes to them, even if they were so small compared to YouTube, you know? Uh, and, uh, but you know, we also love our outsiders and they were so small, they were something like 180 employees. It was like a big startup, you know? It's still like a big startup somehow, but they are something like 32 second biggest sites in the world in terms of number of users per month, something like 200 million unique visitors, unique users per month. So yeah, the whole thing looked nice to us and, and because we were not into this all-in mentality, because what would have been the option? I mean, I, had my, I have my family in, in, in Switzerland. I mean, I received a lot of support from my family, you know, I mean, it was not so obvious for us to move to the U.S. like that, you know. It's not so, it's not so easy, actually, when you are 40-something or 30-something. The thing is, is that we should have done it. That's one of my conclusions. Two years before the acquisition, or when Google knocked at the door, we should have moved to the U.S. immediately. And we didn't do it for many reasons. I had my day job at EPFL because I didn't want to have any salary. We wanted to invest all our money. We were burning 40,000 Swiss francs per month was nothing compared to US-based VC, uh, US-based uh, uh, startups, and backed by US VCs. It was nothing, and, uh, but we had those constraints. It was not so easy to move there, so we made this Swiss next a trip for three months that was very useful. I mean, okay, it's a long story. I have so many things to tell you about this trip, but anyway, so we should have stayed there. It was not so easy, because you have to be in the same room as the engineers when you work collectively on something, so, and everybody in the team is so important, you know? All of them were pilots, you know? We had this Ruby on Rails backend web developer who is a super talented guy, one of the best in Europe. He was on his shoulder managing with another guy who also worked with him. They were both of them I mean, managing everything, the multiple database we had online, the multiple cloud services we had, just two guys, you know? If one of them would have left, that would have been a mess, you know? Or very difficult. I mean, we would have survived, but you know, you lose so many knowledge if someone loses. So we were so bonded together, it was not so easy. I don't know. So, but, but yes, we should have moved to the US, and we should have done this kind of hybrid model, which is to probably move the, the co-founder in the US to be in touch with the VC and keep the engineers at home in order they are not com uh, immediately hired by Facebook and all the other, but it still happens. I know stories from uh, people at EPFL in Lausanne. They have engineers that have been uh, hunted by Facebook and, and uh, Facebook, I think I'm almost sure of that in, in two occasions. 
so yeah, this hybrid model of having a Swiss or international presence with your developers and the, the business or the founders in, in Silicon Valley for web, it makes a lot of sense. And there is such a startup in Lausanne called TypeSafe, which is exactly doing that. Uh, they are, you know, uh, having as their founder the, 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 the professor who invented this, the Scala language, which is uh, used by LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on. So they are applying that model, and they have very good VCs. So we hope it's going to be a success uh, for them. But yeah, I will do it that way the next time, if I will do a new startup. I will incubate probably the concept here because I'm living here, but very quickly move to the US to meet uh, potential partners very early on, including for a potential exit, you know? You have to know the people early on. When the process of selling the company has started and when your M&A boutique start to pitch your uh, case to several companies, I mean, it was funny. I can tell that. I don't know if it's something that you do on camera, but uh, oh my God, you have to cut a lot of things. No. <laughs> but uh, no, we, we pitched to a very well-known company. Uh, I mean, our M&A boutique pitched to a very well-known company. They have 70 people in the M&A department receiving you know, a proposal for a company to be sold to them every day. Uh, and then one of their uh, employees look at the say they know in the trash bin immediately. And then we were lucky that they knew a, a retired vice president of that company, uh, this M&A boutique we were working with. And this guy sent an email to the CEO. It's one of the biggest Silicon Valley uh, company. A very nice company, and then, and then our case was actually looked at by the by people who actually acquired company for one billion dollars. So, so, and then we have a very nice interaction with them. But the fact we were not there, we had to do a, we had to pitch through uh, Skype. You know, that was so crazy. I mean, it, we were uh, handicapped so, somehow. I mean, uh, yeah. So it's very important to establish connections. Uh, with investors, with partners, where they are. So that's why this place is so attractive. Because, uh, yeah, it makes your life more difficult if you are not in such an ecosystem, I believe. But, uh, yeah, there are many things to say about that. But, uh, because on the other side, it seems we are having the best technologies around. And it's not to, to try to be proud or to compensate something. It's true, huh? At EPFL or ETH here in Zurich, everybody is excellent investor. Say you are really, really good science there and good technologies. It's very strong stuff that have a lot of potential. But then how do you uh, materialize this potential? That's the, the challenge. So yeah, next time I will connect much more early on with the US. And that will be my advice for web startups. Cool. Uh, another question? Um, how do you compensate them? You probably don't have the money. I mean, saying that your burn rate was at 40k, um, you, so, you don't really. Yeah. Do you, did, did you have a stock yeah. option, option program? Yeah, or? that was a very interesting thing, actually. Uh, yeah, it's a long. It's going to be a long answer again. But uh, I mean, my previous startups, we spent a hundred thousand francs to shape a stock option plan with some sort of consulting company that's also very famous uh, internationally. Actually, we drew, drafted the contract in the end ourselves with one, one of our investors who was a, law, a lawyer himself. We really wasted a lot of money. And we were used at the parliament in 2000, you know, or 1999, 2000, 1999, as a case for what would be stock option taxation you know, in Switzerland. So they were, we were somehow one of the first to implement stock option. With Gillian, I mean, it was so expensive, it's so complicated, I decided to do completely differently. Because the productivity was so high with, uh, with Gillian, where just six people completely passionate about what they were doing, so productive, that allowed us to be extremely generous with them. So ra rather than to have 0.002% uh, ownership, potential potential uh, ownership of the company, we gave all of them 2% of equity of the company, 2%. That's a lot. I mean, that's maybe what you're going to pay your VP of marketing when you do the Series A, V, C round, you know? Or maybe a CEO will get 4 5%. I don't know. I, I'm not into those figures since a long time, but this is what I heard. So we gave each one of them the potential to get that 
two percent. But I drafted the contract myself this time. Actually, that was just three lines saying, "Okay, guys, you're not going to vest the thing. Uh, you know, you know how how vesting is working. You stay for four years." You get a 25% or maybe half of it after two years, and then you get 75% or 25% more after three years and 100% after four years, you know, of those options. And then you can exercise them with some condition. But I didn't do that at all. I mean, I just say, okay, you're going to get 2%. Uh, when we implement the plan at some point, basically when we'll have VCs, or if there is an exit, when we sell the company. If you leave, you have nothing. So it was very generous on one hand and very strict on the other hand. And it costed me nothing. It costed me just uh, 30 minutes of thinking, discussion with my co-founder with two, three lines that survived the analysis and the due diligence of six lawyers during the M&A process. So I was very proud of me, but it was a bit, <laughs> it was a bit dangerous to do that. But uh, at some point, that shows you also that at some point you have to do it yourself, you know? Uh, I, mean, I mean, with Singularis, you know, I was surrounded with people that were not the employees, but you know, advisors, consultants that were telling me how I have to do things, you know, because I felt unsure and I was uh, insecure somehow because I didn't have the experience. So with Gillian, because we were small, we were able to be generous, but that was also the plan. And the employees, to answer your question, they were paid normal salaries. We didn't want them to suffer, and then it's not scalable. After four years, they say, okay, maybe. Uh, feel like that, you know, I have, to, I have to feed my family, I have to quit, I'm so sad, but I have to quit. No, no, no. I mean, maybe in the US it works like that, people work for free, they got stock options, but in Switzerland it's not really the mood, you know, and people that are used to have a salary, maybe a lower salary than in UBS, uh, but a salary that is maybe similar to actually what was EPFL salaries, which are not bad at all, you know, but maybe 40% less than at UBS. Uh, or, yeah. Or oh, UBS actually 40% more than uh, EPF, I don't know, 30% maybe. Yeah. So we really aimed at paying them all the time. But what, once what happened is just also to give you some information about that, because somehow we were a rock band, you know? We were a rock band. We assembled like a, I will not say a boys band, but uh, a rock band. I mean, they, those people really like to work together. And the team was so important, we saw that at YouTube, when we talked with them, the team was so important. So it was important that to, to maintain this spirit. That was our main asset somehow with the technology and the excitement we got. So what happened once is that we, we, were, we were doing consulting on the side we, we, with very limited amount. But for us, that was a lot. 400,000 Swiss francs of consulting was made to feed the company. So it was a lot and some distraction, you know, also. But we decided to do that because for many other reasons, we didn't want to dilute too much the company. And um, okay, so we, uh, at some point, we, we were had a liquidity problem. And so we were super nervous with my co-founders and we came to the employees asking them, are you okay if we uh, diminish your salaries by a third for the next three months? Because we were supposed to have this mandate, you know, this work, consulting work. And it has been canceled in the middle of the summer, you know, nobody was there to compensate for that loss. And the reaction was amazing because as a founder, you're always going to probably uh, uh, fear the reaction of your uh, employees, but most of the time they are your most loyal supporters. I remember at Singularis, I had to fire 20 people. I was so sick to fire people. You know, I was trained or ready to hire people. You, know, you remember it was a challenge and not completely the same process. But firing people, I never thought about firing people. But some people at Singularis 10 years before, they told me, maybe this is normal, you want to fire? I said, I was so nervous. We have to fire you. I'm, I'm ashamed. Uh, it's, uh, and so on. And uh, because, yeah, we, we were spending like a half a million uh, per month and the wall was coming very quickly. And, and those guys, they say, okay, no problem. It's very important that the company survive. You are making the right decision to fire me. And so I, I love the company and so on. They were so supportive. I, I almost cried, you know, to, with such a reaction. And this is what happened at Gillian. I mean, our employees, they told me, but this is no problem, Midi. You know what? Because if we fail, I'm going to have to change my face with a surgeon, you know, and change my name because it's going to be, uh, I mean, they felt so 
so close to, to the project. And wow, I was very impressed by this reaction. But still, you have to, you cannot, you cannot sleep on that for 10 years, you know. There are some limits. And people, after some time, and in our case, it was seven years. I mean, most of, I mean, our early employees, they, they were with us for seven years. And it's a long time. And at some point, they want to see something else. And that's why the, also this exit was a good thing, because it allowed us to move to something else. And you know, so there was many factors. And the employees was one of them. But uh, yeah, they had normal salaries. They made efforts, but uh, just for three months in seven years. But in general, they were making efforts, but they had 2% of the company, which is great, I can tell you. Uh, you don't see that kind of deal very often huh, for employees. OK, they were key employees or core employees, but you know. One last question from the audience. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on the M&E process that you proactively started with your co-founder yeah. after you turned Google back? So that's a huge topic, but a very important one, because I feel we are too naive on that domain. Uh, at least I was too naive. I felt like stupid, you know, after 20 years doing startups. Now it's 20 years. At the time, it was maybe 15 years. I said, OK, you never really knew how it works. Uh, I said, that's a shame. And we don't have enough exit in Switzerland, apparently. That's a shame, too. And, and, and really now, after I mean, since we made this exit, I really want, I'm really available for other people if they want to, to share this experience with them to try to help them to be less naive than we were, less newbie than we were. So we were lucky to meet, as I said, a former VC, retired VC, who told us very, you know, realistically how it was going to happen. First, those M&A boutique, apparently, they never work with an independent company like us. They pro they're most of the time contacted by one of their investors, VCs, they, they know each other, and they uh, discuss about the potential sale exit of your company, how it's going to work. They establish a plan, they look at the market, they look at the opportunities, and they devise a plan, if you want. So it was already, they, they told, this, this person told us it, will, it was very rare that they would work with people like us, but we had such a buzz and also those two companies that already approached us, so they accepted to work with us. So, and then we learned also that you have to exactly uh, define what those guys, they have to achieve for you, because they can embark you on two tracks. One would be uh, high, uh, raising money, and one would be to sell the company, but they get, get the same fees on both tracks. So this person told us you have to, to tell them very clearly that you want to sell the company that you are not, don't want to raise money, because for them it's much more easy to take their phone and call some of, some of their VC in their region, and people maybe you don't want to work with because they don't have the connection, they don't have the background, uh, the track record, sorry. Uh, and yeah, and, and it's such a deal will be done much more easily than selling a company. It's much more effort for them to sell a company, apparently. So we were very lucky to got this crash course, if you want, on how it was going to work. That, those are just a few aspects. So we, we talked to three of those firms. Two wanted to work with us. They're receiving something like 20 proposals per month, and they have to choose. They allocate project managers to that. Maybe one, they choose one case per month, you know? So, so two, they, two, two wanted to work with them, with us, sorry. And uh, we choose one for some cr criteria. And uh, yeah, we really prepared in advance um, valorization report, how they call it. You know, they're going to, they're going to put a price on you. Um, uh, the information memorandum, which is a documentation for M&A departments of potential acquirers to, 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 to look at. We did that before we were launching our second major milestone, which was launched in December 2012, which was two years after this initial buzz, which was our, our beautiful framework. Uh, so we, we said, okay, we have to prepare that, because if we are not able to raise money with excellent VCs, then at least maybe there will be also this, uh, this option. And this is what materialized, because we launched the technology in the 14th, uh, the, the, on December 14th, 2012, we were in San Francisco doing that. 
And in January, mid-January, uh, we got a call from the CTO of uh, Dailymotion. Hey guys, it's great, uh, can we have a chat discussing what you do? And then the contract was signed in December 2013, you know? And we, yeah, we had this meeting with them, a couple of meetings in April, we said, we, we, they, they formally told us, okay, we really want to acquire you. And so let's start the, the process, which was extremely, extremely uh, interesting for me to learn because it's, you know, the, 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 the main shareholder of uh, Dailymotion is Orange, who has a very professional m and department, who is acquiring actually telecoms all around the world. And they were treating us like a 1,000 or several thousand, 10,000 uh, employee company or telco, you know. They applied to a six team company in Lausanne, the same process, acquisition process as uh, a big telco. And for me, it has been so interesting to go through, through that process. So, and now I'm really interested to share that, uh, what I learned, because I think uh, we should be much more prepared about that. Things that are maybe more common for, for entrepreneurs elsewhere, definitely in the US. But I think in Switzerland, on one hand, we have great technologies, great people, but we miss that experience. And uh, this is something that should happen much more often because as entrepreneurs, you need to do those cycles. It's, it's right to sell your company because this is what will happen most of the time, except failure, you know? And uh, this is part of the, the, how do you call that, food chain? No, maybe not, but uh, yeah. So it's very important. You learn a lot and yeah, it's, it, it, it was, uh, the process has been amazing for us. We, I mean, I had really bad experience with lawyers that were not familiar with startups, you know? In this case, with lawyers we were work with from on Dailymotion side, and on our side too, by the way, but mainly on Dailymotion side, uh, in the sense that they were a big firm, they, they are only doing that, you know? They are only doing M&A deals. They have a process, they know how startups are, they help to, to put people, uh, to help people from big companies, to discuss with people from startups that are somehow different in their mindset. That was so helpful. We were very anxious that we will have to deal with many levels of complexity, such as you have to manage your lawyers because he doesn't understand anything about what you do. You have to manage your accountant because he's jealous that you're going to make a lot of money on a personal basis. So you have so many things to manage in parallel sometimes. That was, none of those things happened to us that in that time. So we just had the luck to work with very professional people but still, the process lasted 12 months, you know? So it was exhausting, I can tell you that. But again, we don't have enough experience, apparently, about exits. And yeah, I'm very happy at EPFL. I'm still at EPFL at the moment. Uh, to, to share a bit of that with, uh, with young entrepreneurs there, and uh, yeah, in order that they don't uh, waste opportunities or lose time uh, addressing these kind of uh, challenges. Okay, no, thank you very much, Mehdi, for your time. Um, I don't know whether you're going to stick around to answer any other questions from anybody who wants to, to speak to you. Yeah, thank okay. you for the invitation. So thank you very much. And uh, well, to everybody. <laughs> <laughs>